I'm going to start the next session, which will run through to um, 12.20, under the new um, timetable that we have. And this, the, the next session is called, entitled Looking to the Future, Unmet Clinical Needs and Research Gaps. Um, we have a, a variety of different speakers. And the first of those is Sarah Baitup, who's Clinical Lead for Psychology Online. Good morning. It's a great pleasure to be invited to speak with you today about something which I am incredibly passionate about, and that is making a difference to people's lives. I'm a, a cognitive behaviour therapist with about 25 years' experience. And we all know the statistics. We know how many people are likely to experience a mental health problem. And we all know um, about the gap provision and everything that can in some way do something about that gap has got to be a good thing. So I'm hoping that um, in my short talk this morning that you're going to learn a little bit about what we do um, at Psychology Online, what we know about providing evidence-based interventions via the internet and what we need to know. The term ICBT and CCBT were coined in the 1990s and basically they mean anything um, from an app to Skype delivered intervention, telephone delivered CBT, guided self-help, internet-enabled self-help programs. And I think one of the problems in looking at the literature in the field of CBT, when you look at the growing array of papers that are out there, is that there is a problem in terms of the terminology and the language that we use. And I think part of the work that we need to do is, is, to, is to demystify and clarify what we mean when we're talking about technology-enhanced psychological interventions. Certainly when I talk to clinicians and academics across the UK about what I do, and I'm incredibly passionate about it, is that I, I, people either assume they know what I'm talking about. So when I talk about internet-enabled CBT, they assume I'm either talking about Skype or beating the blues. And I'm, talk I'm not actually talking about any of those things. Um, and, I, and I think as you read through sort of the latest papers, there's new and evolving terms, and some people have tried to classify the terms, and it just becomes more and more confusing. So I thought I would actually start by clarifying what it is that we do. Psychology Online have been around for about 12 years, but in the last three years we've been working with the NHS, predominantly within IAPT, to widen access and offer people choice. You've heard some of the speakers earlier on this morning talk about the huge gap there is when people are referred to an IAPT service. It's predominantly a nine to five service and you've got to go somewhere. Um, usually a GP surgery or a clinic somewhere, and that's incredibly anxiety-provoking. I think those of you who are clinicians will understand what I mean when I say that it's, people have got to be incredibly brave to enter therapy. It's a, it's a really big deal, and anything that we can do to enable people to access therapy has got to be a good thing. So, this might be a bit shocking when I tell you that our the 150 therapists that we have working with us, none of those therapists and their patients will ever speak to each other or see each other. Which sounds quite counterintuitive when we're delivering CBT. But we deliver CBT using written communication. So therapist and patient will communicate with each other in two ways through a synchronous therapy session, your standard 60-minute therapy session, where therapist and patient meet at the given time and have a session. But they're just communicating via text. And um, this slide here 
gives you a little bit of a flavour. It's the beginning of a therapy session here. And as the session progresses after the 60 minutes over, you have a transcript of that therapy session, which the patient has access to for the rest of their lives. So if they have eight or nine hours of therapy, they can go back and reread the transcript. Now, one of my colleagues earlier on this morning said that actually being able to access your therapy sessions and re-reading them or listening to them if they're recorded enables consolidation of learning. And CBT is very much about learning. And there is something about having CBT reading and writing which enables people to process information in a very different way than we do when we're speaking, whether that's on the telephone, via Skype, or in a traditional face-to-face. -face. There are many of you that I can see writing notes. Now, you're doing that because you know that you will not remember everything that is said here today. And that's what the patient is doing when they're having therapy in this way. They're reading and writing, and that requires quite a lot of thinking and reflection. And then afterwards, they can go back and reread that session. Now, often, what we hope for in therapy is that there's going to be a light bulb moment where the patient says, oh, of course, I get it. Now I understand. But what, we, what I know, and many of you who are clinicians will know, that those light bulb moments don't hang around for very long. They're slippery. So two or three days later, the patient has forgotten all about it. And it, because it's, it was auditory, they heard it in the session, they won't remember. And even when they go back to their session a week later, they may not remember that, and they might have to be reminded. When they, do, when they have CBT in this way, they can go back and they can read it, and they can relive that aha moment. If the therapist says something that's supportive or encouraging, they can go back and reread it. Now, as well as the synchronous therapy session, therapist and patient also communicate asynchronously through a secure messaging system. So this is out-of-session communication. This is vitally important to this way of delivering CBT. So the asynchronous messaging is very useful for the obvious, for cancelling or rearranging appointments, but more importantly, it enables the therapist and the patient to continue to have a collaborative relationship and to focus on goals and to focus on out-of-session tasks. So if somebody is, um, maybe has a goal of increasing their activity or taking the children to school or going swimming and they've written their goals up on the system and this week the person is going to work on going swimming once they can message their therapist and say, I just haven't managed it this week. I couldn't even get out of the front door. And the therapist is able to message back and say, OK, let's talk about that on Friday. Or maybe they have, the patient has managed it and said, I've done it. And the therapist can message back and say, that's fantastic, well done. Now, that sounds very, very simple. But actually, it's a really essential component because it's really, really hard to maintain motivation in between sessions. And anything that can be done to keep people focused on why they're having CBT, the, the things that they're learning, their goals, is fantastic. And patients report it was incredibly motivating. It's like having my therapist sort of looking over my shoulder at all times. Or if I had a hiccup or a difficulty, I knew my therapist was, would be there and was listening so it really keeps people on task and keeps people motivated. And we know that for every hour's worth of therapy that someone has, they are online on our system for an equal amount of time at least. Now, that may be one of the reasons why people don't require as many sessions um, when they have CBT in this way, because actually they're working a lot harder than they might be in a face-to-face -face setting. I think it's important not to kind of to forget some of the reasons why we might adopt technology in the field of mental health. So referring again to the Chief Medical Officer's report, we're looking at the incremental clinical benefits 
to patients. We've got to know that it works, um, not just in terms of recovery, but in terms of patient satisfaction, but also in terms of a health economic argument. And it's also about improving access to therapy. So we deliver therapy 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And we know when patients are able to actually choose when they want to have therapy, that they will choose to have therapy between 6 o'clock in the evening and 10 o'clock at night, Monday to Friday. So our service is driven by patient need. We don't have a waiting list. So the waiting list is, is only as long as the patient wishes to wait. And we're able to do that because we are a remote internet service. So we draw therapists from across the UK who are able to offer patients therapy sessions at all sorts of times of day and night. And this is really great for fairly obvious reasons, for people who work, who can't have time off work and want to see somebody you know, in the evening. It's great for people who are too anxious to come to therapy. We had a, a, a comment from a patient fairly recently who self-referred to the service. Um, she found out about her service and she emailed and said, the letter dropped through my door and it said that I could have therapy online. I've been wanting therapy for years. My GP has nagged me, but I can't go to the local IAP service. And she said within five minutes of reading the leaflet, she was online referring herself to the service. Because it's a big deal if you're anxious to come and see somebody like me um, in a clinic. Um, so if you strip away all of that anxiety-provoking stuff, the waiting room, the eye contact, what people think, the walk or the bus ride, um, if you strip away all of those things, you're widening access. This is also great for people who've got um, long-term health conditions, chronic pain, who are carers, parents, all of whom will have difficulty accessing services in the traditional way. We talked about the health economic argument. We've worked recently with the York Health Economic Consortium to look at the health economic benefits of providing CBT online in this way. And there is a very, very strong, fairly early argument at the moment that there's a very good health economic argument for people who present with a moderate um, degree of mental health difficulties. And of course, any service has got to align with policy. And we've already seen earlier that you know, the technology-enhanced psychological interventions is mentioned um, and, and people are welcoming it. Just in terms of what we know about um, CBT um, delivered in the way that we do, obviously in the literature already we know that technology enhanced CBT is a good thing. It works. We know from the literature that the, best, the, most, the most efficacious results will be where there is a, a high proportion of therapist intervention. So we know that self-help programs are more problematic, but if you actually put a therapist and use guided um, self-help programs, that the results improve, and the more therapist intervention that you have, the better the results. Now, 2007 to 2009, David Kessler from the University of Bristol and Michael King from UCL conducted an RCT um, delivering... CBT online using the system that I've showed you um, for patients with a presentation of depression. And actually what we discovered is we got some very reasonable recovery rates. We all know that depression is a little bit more difficult to treat and that usually the recovery results are a bit lower. Patients who present with anxiety disorders, usually the recovery rates are higher. So actually you know, these results were, were, were really, really helpful and really great. So we know that CBT delivered via written communication is effective. And we have 2,000 patients that have had treatment with us. And so we've got a lot of data. And we know that CBT delivered in this way via written communication is just as effective as any other IAP service, if not a bit better. So it works. So the stuff that we know about this, this is our health economic study 
um, that we did a few months ago. And there you can see with our moderate impairment, um, we've got um, some, some quite significant results there. This is fairly early stuff. We need to do more of it. So we, we're beginning to get a picture that this is effective. People recover. People like it. We know that the DNA rate is actually um, reduced. So about 10% of our patients fail to attend appointments. We know that the dropout rate is less than an IAP service. So once people engage with us, they tend to stick with it. So this is the evidence so far. The recovery rate, same as face-to-face, -face, if not a little bit better. We, one of the things that we also know, having had 2,000 patients to date going through therapy, is that people require fewer sessions than they would in an IAP service. Now, we've got some hypotheses about what that's, what that's about. One of those things is, I think, it's about the amount of work that people are doing in between sessions. So they're logging into the system, reviewing their transcripts, looking at their goals, mes messaging their therapists. So they're engaged a lot more in the work that they need to do. I think another one of the, the reasons why people require fewer sessions is that they get to the point a lot quicker. There is something about, and this is in the literature, isn't it? There is something about working online that people don't mince their words. They just get to the point. And we also know, I know from looking at thousands of transcripts of therapy, that people tend to cut the social chat. There is much less, oh, it's cold today, or, you know, 38 sleeps to, to Christmas, that kind of thing. We tend not to see any of that stuff in the transcripts because people seem to get the idea we're here to do a piece of work and they get straight down to it. The other hypothesis is that it enables both therapist and patient to reflect. So as you would imagine, there is a much slower pace. We can't type as fast as we can speak. But actually what that means is that the therapist can really focus on asking effective questions, sticking to the agenda, using a specific protocol, making sure that we're actually doing a piece of work and not chatting about something else. And the patient can actually look at the question that's being asked and think about it and reflect. And that's where the learning takes place. So they're processing that information. We know it's very effective for moderate presentations. Um, and we've got some early indication that people who have CBT in this way prolong their recovery for longer. So it's great that we know lots of stuff, but actually there's a whole lot more stuff there to learn. So we've, we're asking some very important questions. For whom is CBT um, delivered in this way most efficacious? Does internet-enabled CBT delivered in this way enhance learning? So this is an argument, it's a question about visual learning, reading and writing, versus oral learning. Is it something about these mechanisms that enhances learning? And this last question here, which is also very important, so we're looking at a longitudinal study at the moment, following people up, asking the question, do people prolong their recovery rates? So some really important questions. Thank you. All right. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Simon Wilson, who's the clinical director for Big White Wall. And he will tell you about this novel uh, internet and mobile phone app system. Just before I tell you a bit about Big White Wall, I was struck a bit by the themes this morning, and, and may, maybe it is that I'm more gung-ho, but I, I wonder if there's a sort of clinician-academic split. So last month I was at the International Society for Research in Internet Interventions, and I just thought I'd share with you a couple of uh, observations from that conference. So the, the first one is, uh, as a clinical psychiatrist, I really wonder how many more randomised control trials we need to know that this is effective. So Azi Barak, who's probably one of the world leaders in this area, gave a presentation where he'd looked at uh, studies published in the literature about internet-delivered CBT between 1996 and 2013. There are 936 papers, 936 studies, including 28 meta-analyses. That, to me, feels like a pretty evidence-based bit of psychiatry. I don't think we need to worry about that too much. 
The other part of it, I was reflecting, the world leaders in this area are not us, and maybe that reflects some of our conservatism. It's a bit new for us. The world leaders are the Australians and the Swedes. And I was wondering why that is. And I, I, I think it might be to do with the flying doctors. So I think in Australia, providing healthcare remotely is entirely normal. No, no cultural shift is required. It was done with a telephone and an aeroplane rather than a modem and a computer. But it's not a, it's not a sea change in the practice of medicine. For us, it is, and it feels uncomfortable and different and I wonder if that's why we're a little conservative in our approach to it in a, in a way that the Australians and the Swedes too I guess with a geographically remote uh, population often snowbound a very under-resourced mental health service so just those were sort of a couple of reflections at the beginning perhaps on what had happened this morning now having said all that I am interested in evaluation as part of Big White Wall and I'll tell you about some of those things that we're doing but I think for slightly different reasons than we've heard this morning so some of you will know about this service some won't. I, I'm kind of assuming most people don't, and I'll, I'll just give you an overview, essentially, in the, in the time I've got. So we are a digital mental health service, so that means you know, it, uh, I use digital rather than online because we have uh, apps as well as a, a, uh, an internet platform. And we've been going for some time. I'll describe the service to you. But, so we started in 2007. I think for me, one of the other reflections in terms of meetings like this and the ISRI one is there are often three different sorts of people in the room. So there are a group of academics, usually academic psychologists actually, rather than psychiatrists, a group of clinicians and a group of commercial people. And they're often approaching the same area in a very different direction. So the academic conferences are dominated by academics who've done nice studies that they want to tell you about, not very generalizable as, as often is the case with randomized control trials. And they're sort of wondering about, wouldn't it be a good idea to commercialize this, but I've got no idea how to do that. The commercial companies are busy, they've already made something, but they're kind of wondering, does this actually work? Am I, and what about the regulation? And can I partner with somebody? And so trying to sort of think about where that, it's interesting, I think, to think about where people are coming from when they are describing things. So Big White Wall started the other way around. Big White Wall started because uh, Jen, who's the CEO, wanted there to be a place like this on the internet where she could discuss stuff. And there wasn't one, so she made one. And then the sort of, the worrying about well, what's the, the scientific content of that came second. I think that that's okay to say that. Um, but you know, we think we've built something that's quite good. So the, the real heart of Big White Wall is a support network. So, and it, that's important to hold in mind because it didn't start with a, a professional or a clinician building this website. But that begins to fit with a kind of recovery model that's, you know, that's become uh, of interest in, in mental health services. So the heart of the service is an anonymous, online, peer support network. People talk to one another about stuff that's bothering them. Now, mostly that's aimed at the kind of mild to moderate common mental disorders space, so sort of primary care mental health, perhaps a population-wide uh, approach. But we are a diagnosis agnostic, that's quite hard to say, diagnosis agnostic service so we're not you don't need a diagnosis to get in and also we don't exclude you if you have a different diagnosis so you know we sometimes have people who have psychosis it seems to me from the nature of their postings uh, on big white wall and you know some of that stuff we can manage and, and i'll come on to but we're aimed essentially at common mental disorders depression anxiety now in addition to the support network we have guided support which is very much like computerized cbt so Again, good evidence base for computerized CBT, and we have at the far end live therapy, so you can access a therapist online and see someone for mostly CBT, but also IPT and counseling, like an IAP service, and you can do that by video, audio, or text. So this is what Big White Wall looks like when you come on. So you can see, um, you can do some tests, you can fill in, uh, a depression score, an anxiety test, a, uh, an alcohol test. You can find other people who are talking about the same stuff as you and look at their postings or join in with them. You can uh, sign up to do a guided support program for you know, managing negative thoughts, for example, or you can access a therapist. One of the other things you can do that's sort of part of the big white wall community is to, is to draw a brick. That's the wall and to express how you're feeling. And I think quickly, when the service began, uh, the, 
with no clinicians involved, I think people started to feel a bit nervous about, well, actually, we've built this nice community and people are sharing things, but might there be some harms involved in them doing that and how do we think about it? So they initially partnered with the Tavistock and Portman and now have their own uh, in-house team, so people like me. And often what we're doing, the community is not a uh, Wild West free-for-all, it's a moderated community, moderated by councillors 24 hours a day. And often what we are doing as a part of a clinical service is that there is a sort of robust clinical structure and clinical governance procedures to keep things safe. And I guess the, the safety things we're thinking about are primarily things that might be triggering like this. Now that for me, just to sort of step aside and put on a sort of academic -y clinician's hat, that's an area of interest for me. I don't know if anybody's looked at the triggering literature. There is almost none. There's one paper I can find that's, you know, half decent that just asks people whether they would find an image triggering. About half said yes, about half said no. But it's become a kind of uh, a currency in this area, but with almost no evidence attached to it. So that's something I'm interested in thinking about. But for the moment, we hold in mind there's an idea about this stuff and we want to keep people safe. Um, the other, the other big thing is when people might uh, break anonymity and we want people to, we want the site to be anonymous because we think people will share more readily and we're, we're not a dating site, we don't want people hooking up to me offline, this is a separate uh, and space that's safe. But also put, people put in an enormous amount of effort and look after one another really well. Mostly my interactions with it are extremely heartening, just seeing how well people treat one another and how well they look after each other. This is a brick made by one member and sent to another one just to as a present. So then just in terms of our commitment to evaluate, so we've, we've built this service. For me, if you think about that kind of uh, pyramid of evidence, the live therapy and the guided support end, for me, are in a space that is extremely well researched. And of course, it's important for us to evaluate that, and we're doing some evaluations. But essentially, I, you know, I, as far as I'm concerned, the, you provide CBT is an evidence-based psychiatric treatment. The fact that you're providing it via a computer is about as relevant as providing it in a red room rather than a yellow room. And nobody's suggesting that we need to look at the, the colour of the room that the, the practice is going on in. I'm not sure it's much different to that. But as we sort of move down the other bits of the service, guided support and how close that is to the computerised CBT models, that becomes a slightly more interesting question. But the big question for us, I think, is the support network, which is essentially the heart of the service. And we're very, we've got our own data that's rather softer. So people talk about, about three quarters of people say that they talk about something for the first time there. It's a, st it's a space that they feel safe in. About 90% of people say that they get one, at least one well-being benefit from using the site. But that's pretty soft data, and we're interested in thinking about that more. And again, I think it's something unique. So trying to find a good comparator in the literature is very difficult. So there is a, there is a psychiatric literature about peer support, but it's an incredibly heterogeneous literature. And it means so many different things, it's almost meaningless. I can't find a good comparator. So lots of the peer support literature actually is about people who've had severe mental illness themselves, being trained up and then acting as a person's care coordinator or an auxiliary to the care coordinator. Now that's nothing like peer support here. So we're very interested to Think about that. So here are some studies we've got going on at the moment. We're, I'm not an academic, so my job is to, is to be a midwife and to foster links with people who are proper academics who can do this properly. So we're very keen to build links with good academic institutions. So we've got some uh, studies going on with UCL, looking at the, uh, particularly the live therapy bit of the service. But the stuff that we're most excited about doing, I think, going forward, uh, are some of these things, and perhaps why we're here, we're, we're um, partners with MindTech and are very keen to think about a randomised control trial of the support network. And, you know, we've, we've got a, uh, an idea, a protocol, an application in place. We're just we're looking for some funding. So any, if there's anybody in the audience who'd like to fund it, please come and speak to me or Richard afterwards. But we think that that would be a really important evaluation. There's not anything else like this. It feels to us like it works. Our members like it and say that there's some benefit. My sense as a clinician is that for some people, this really is a useful place. But uh, we don't know, I think, properly. And also for us is trying to be smarter about our own data. So we're very good at collecting lots of data. And um, but trying to use that and feed that back into the service to continue to improve things. And then lastly, I think, is trying to sort of horizon scan and be thinking about the next things. So 
I don't, I haven't seen any talks with this unwieldy title, but I guess it's around in the ether is ecological momentary analysis. Which sounds like it's a terrible mouthful, but essentially means we're all, we're all carrying smartphones that are uploading all sorts of interesting data about ourselves. Can we use that to think about people's mental states? There are some studies suggesting that yes, we can. We think we can spot depression from people's accelerometer, GPS and Bluetooth data. What can we do with that? How does that interact with this? That to me is, is much more exciting than another RCT of online CBT. So here are my details. I hope that's a good overview of Big White Wall. Happy to do come and ask questions. There's a couple of others from Big White Wall here today as well. Thanks. Okay, so our final speaker in this session is Professor Till Wikes, who I've known for some years, principally through the Mental Health Research Network, which she's, she's directed. Um, but she's also a um, well-established cl clinical psychologist, uh, academic, um, with a long track record of, of successful research in serious mental illness. She promises to give us another alternative view than we have just heard from Simon. So first things first, I am a clinical academic. So I provide, I'm a jobbing clinician. I currently provide some uh, e-health support to the Ebola um, health workers. So I'm doing this as clearly remotely while they're in Freetown. Um, but I also do studies and in particular have uh, been involved in the development and evaluation of a electronic personal health record. And what's one of those? And I just took it off the internet, actually. Uh, it's important that this doesn't say, this says that it's a database of individual health information accessible to and maintained by the patient. It says nothing about who owns the data or, how that, or whether that data is also transferred. And that's an important issue, which I'll come back to later. So we're in a current uh, era of optimism and uh, one of the things I should say to you is that I'm not selling anything. Um, I'm not selling optimism, I'm not selling products. Um, what I'm interested in is how service users uh, feel about healthcare systems and whether it's going to improve things. Uh, Shown this morning talked about the issue of you know, who's actually in the mental health services. Most of secondary care, of course, is severe mental illness. And most of the other things that we've heard about have really been about people with depression and anxiety. But I'm going to concentrate a bit more on the people who do cost a lot of money. So we thought that, and there is some evidence that EPHRs will provide new information to people, um, evaluated information, will introduce new therapies and self-management and we've heard decreasing the, we, none of us talked about what we were going to say today, but all of us have been mentioning this, uh, will decrease the mounting costs in the NHS. And of course, it's going to be a rich source of data on population health. I think the last thing we may well get, but I doubt that we're going to get the decrease in the mounting costs in the NHS, particularly given what we've just been hearing about earlier today. So for mental health, of course, there's other issues. The, EPHRs have improved um, health conditions, particularly issues to do with uh, cardiac disease. Um, but in mental health, we know that there are problems with continuity of care, and maybe EPHRs will help with that continuity. Uh, we know there's problems of engagement. We've heard a bit about it earlier, but certainly for people with severe mental illness. And possibly it will increase empowerment and decision-making uh, decision and choice, which we also know is a key issue for people with mental health problems. So this is the Kaiser Permanente um, data, more than 8.7 million users, eat your heart out. Um, so there they showed that actually they did get fewer hospital visits um, uh, and lots of people used it. So it was uh, important to them because it did save money. However, of course, that's a completely different kind of healthcare system with a different relationship between uh, the service users, the um, purchasers, and the providers of treatment. And when you have to pay to, for a hospital visit, maybe it's cheaper for you to go online than it is to turn up. So what happens in the UK? Well, we have got an example, health space, which was counterintuitive, cumbersome, difficult to use, uninteresting, and registration was complicated. And when they looked at the evaluation, uh, they expected 5 to 10% of people would use it, and what they got was, look very carefully, folks, they got that amount. It was 0.13% of people actually used 
this particular EPHR. So we thought, oh, well, we'll just look at evidence. You know, if we're going to set one up, we need to know what the data is. So we looked for EPHRs and we got 313,000 papers. We put in the word mental and it came down to 123,000. And then we started to look at some of these papers for where they'd men mentioned mental more than once. And actually, we got hardly any. And the reason was that mental was only used as an exclusion criterion for the studies. So there really was very little data, but we gleaned from that that there are problems about attitudes to electronic medical data, skills and access to the internet from people who use those EPHRs. There are specific issues associated with mental health, some of them have been mentioned today, that clinicians um, have specific attitudes and concerns about that data, and there are issues to do with clinician skills. So we also decided to look then at the digital divide. Um, Ofcom's surveys of access to internet use showed that older people had problems and didn't really want to get online. Um, and, there, and several people today have talked about, and particularly shown, who's also looked at how many people have got mobile phones, etc. So we decided to do the same thing. So we looked at um, 120 uh, service users. Computer ownership, personal ownership, was actually quite low although they had access to uh, a computer. They had smartphones, but they didn't have much credit. People who were older in exactly the same as the Ofcom studies, um, were, they, it was associated with uh, poor familiarity, access and confidence, but unlike the Ofcom um, surveys, actually they were really enthusiastic to learn. And we also discovered that if you looked for at the BME groups, individuals in those groups had less access at home. And that is quite important because EPHRs contain important personal information. You need to be able to get onto it in a private space. Um, you don't necessarily want to go to the diminishing numbers of internet cafes or access it in the library. So we really do need to deal with inequalities. They need to be addressed right from the beginning. So. Uh, just as everybody else has mentioned, um, we need to learn lessons from the past, but we need to learn from this, that there's a lack of user involvement in the delivery of many of these technologies. We built, um, and this is in the South London and Maudsley NHS Foundation Trust, My Health Locker, which is a system for um, data going from the trust electronic patient records into a portal and vice versa, and has a data inter interchange with general practitioners. And there's a feed out to a clinical and research information system, and that enables you to uh, mine the data for clinical and auditing purposes as well. So we had stakeholder involvement at two levels, so at the strategic level, which is really important, um, but also at the operational level, in the same way that uh, Sean Lewis talked about um, experience-based design, that's exactly what we did. We had um, service users involved at every level. They're still involved. In fact, at the very end here, we've got development and evaluation, and we're look, getting them to look at how, what the usefulness is of different devices and how easy it is on each of these devices. So what, they, what service users wanted was tracking tools, care plans. They wanted facilitated drop-ins because they were worried that they wouldn't be able to use the system. They wanted social networking features, but this is the one thing, and as been mentioned in the big white wall presentation, this is, there is some concerns about that at the moment, so we haven't yet added it in. We have a patient portal and a clinical portal um, designed to make it easy for people to read. We have those things that the service users wanted, so care plans, um, my health, so that enables you to um, actually monitor your own physical health, which we know is an issue, particularly things like blood pressure and uh, activity. Um, we chose PROMS to put into it at the beginning on uh, the basis of two um, criteria. The first and main one was service user value. 
and we'd previously done a study looking at the value of various outcomes for service users using nominal groups. This is the Warwick Edinburgh well-being scale. However, the other criteria was how much they cost, because actually some of these outcomes are licensed uh, electronically and they cost a lot of money to get people to use to put onto a system. So we're inventing some of our own. We had facilitated drop-ins and the drop-ins are required well, we now have a, a, a course, a 10-week course, where people go from the basics of using a mouse right through you know, how to use the self-monitoring tools through to interpreting graphs. Over 10 weeks, it's a limited 10-week period because we don't want it to become, which it seemed to be becoming at the beginning, more of a kind of tea and biscuits social um, uh, uh, issue. So we've got 501 people have now got a My Health Locker account. That's 2%, so we're already way above the, the, the health space numbers. 2% of those individuals in active care within the SLAM Trust, that's the number of people who have more than, uh, have two appointments or more within a year. We looked at in, um, engagement and we used a really stringent criterion of, of actually filling out the self-monitoring tool twice. I don't know how you use any electronic health services that you are provided with. I have one with my GP. Well, I go and lurk, but I don't necessarily actually do anything with it. Um, I might see if I've actually got a repeat prescription, as in they've shoved it somewhere, but I don't do very much else. Um, we had 58 participants. We looked at, they were re just referred to the drop-in clinics. 55% of those engaged, so not all. But over a period of time, we were able to access, 25 people allowed us access to their electronic care records to look at their notes. So not all, everybody did agree to that. And they had completed a large number of problems. So they were using the, the system as it should be. But we were also able to de uh, define where they had accessed the, uh, the system. And as you can see, 19 people actually only used the service when they were in the facilitated drop-in, although there were people who clearly used it absolutely independently. So that's an issue in severe mental illness. The same uh, issue was shown that they, they were all happy, generally happy with it and found that self-monitoring was useful. Um, but I think we need to sort of take a step back a bit, we, we should now be able to criticise ourselves about what we're doing. So I think we can expect engagement, so 55% is pretty high actually for um, this kind of service. Um, so I think, but it does require careful service user involvement. I think we can probably reduce no shows because I think we can um, help to engage people better into services. At the moment, the self-monitoring benefits are only shown by the service user's enthusiasm for them and not by things like um, major changes in their um, well-being over time or their use of services. And I think we've had an increase in costs because we've had to provide facilitated drop-in clinics, we've had to have extra communications to get the whole thing out there, and we've had to provide technology where people just could not access it in a private space. So we need to be aware of what you need to do. And one of the difficulties of selling all of this technology on the basis that it's cheap is that what will happen is commissioners will be cutting services and cutting those things that service users do value. I checked with somebody in the break actually whether she'd like the computer because she's had both the computer or a person and she'd said she would actually prefer to see a person. Now, I think the two going together is hand in hand is fine, but I think cutting one in favour of the other is not necessarily fine. So, we can't expect speed. Uh, Shown mentioned that. I just don't think you get engagement takes time. I think there will, there's, there's, there's likely, the, the, we can't expect short term decreases in costs. We're going to have to collect a lot more data to see those, those. We can't expect clinician enthusiasm, and several people have. Um, suggested why that might be. It is likely to slow productivity in the short term and maybe even in the long term and at the moment we can't expect empowerment. We knew that from health space because 
What they're saying here is that the process of entering and accessing data cannot be meaningfully separated from the wider carer relationship. And I really think we've got to think carefully about how these sorts of activities supplement that relationship in a blended approach and don't necessarily completely take over. So we've been trying to allay clinicians' fears, telling them that it doesn't mean that the service users can access the whole record. We need to tell them whether it's safe or not. And we provide them with some inducements, you know, the usual mugs, post-it notes, any and mouse mats, as well as t-shirts and bags. Um, we don't want the tail wagging the dog here. So several people in the audience who are from technology companies will say, oh, well, we've, you've, you know, this is old fashioned. We're much further ahead now than, than this. We can't have the tail wagging the dog. We need to have it the other way around. So we need to think about how to fit this into all of these things into clinical practice. Inherent features of the technology that look um, like exciting and interesting are not enough to get it embedded into services. Technology can shape the roles of the service users and carers, and we need probably to think a lot more about this, about how technology can and should be shaping um, tech, uh, the, the uh, relationship and the other way around. So, we need to know more, don't we, always? We need to have some standard measures, and I think that's an issue for the kite measurements. Um, but we need to have measures of communication and condition management and of the patient and, clin and, and clinician relationship if we're going to start not just selling this, but getting this to have real impact in the health services. We need to know information about mediators and moderators, how different diagnoses it's easier or more difficult. We need to decide how we're measuring empowerment. The assumption in all the literature is if you give them this stuff, somehow you're giving them empowerment. So empowerment's been defined as autonomy, self-efficacy, or choice. Well, just because you say you've now got a choice doesn't mean to say that the person will feel empowered. It's a process. So we have to think about how it's going to be measured in order to be able to say that's what we've got. And we need, really need to measure financial benefits and real costs because I think unlike many of the speakers, that some of these may actually be false. These are not removing costs, they're, they're maybe replacing some costs, but they're not removing them. So this is the My Health Locker general idea of how things happen. We go through from design to implementation, but you really need to know on a project by project approach what the incremental learning is and addressing local needs because each service we've discovered is a different kind of a thing. Um, people want different sorts of things in their services, they work in slightly different ways and you need to work in the organisational culture. So the green line for learning is really important and what we seem to be doing is, is moving forward very fast and not taking that incremental learning back. Just tell you that this is not all but some of the My Health Locker team, some of them are in the audience uh, with us today. We have skills in ser from service users, clinicians, technology, research skills and institutions. So we have all sorts of supports and without a kind of comprehensive approach to this problem, I really don't think you can start um, to move the whole field forward. So no discussion about whether academics should or shouldn't be in the system, whether clinicians should or shouldn't be in, or technology shouldn't, should or shouldn't be in. We need them all. Okay, thank you. <laughs>